Hey, I'm Jay, and let's talk about how I made this work. First off, thank you guys for the comments and the questions in the last video that I posted the time lapse of this project. Uh, this video is going to be about answering those most commonly asked questions, try to get you know some of the things you guys wanted to know about, and also share some details and things I learned along in making the project. So we're just going to like geek out for this time here on uh, all things about this project and making big orky characters like this. So the initial idea for this project when I started was to mash up Lord of the Rings orcs and Warcraft orcs from like Blizzard cinematics. Uh, I always loved Blizzard cinematics. I mean, I still do, but they, you know, they have a special place because they were a big influence when I was in college and school, you know, learning how to do this stuff. And uh, I love me some Warcraft and I played orcs. So there you go. And then uh, Lord of the Rings, because I'm a nerd and I love Lord of the Rings stuff. So I thought, let's mash it up rather than pick one. It also makes it more interesting for me because I can't just, you know, pick a reference of something and like recreate it, which I think would be a little bit less fun. So I thought mashing them up would be cool where I'm using the designs of the Lord of the Rings. I'm really drawing from the uruk and Lurts in particular, and then I'm doing it in the style of Blizzard cinematics. So that's where the green skin comes from and the emphasized proportions and some of that grimy texturing and stuff. Obviously, both of them are really cool. So that was the idea for the project. Before we jump in, I wanna say this video is sponsored by Skillshare. First thousand people to click the link down in the description below will get a free trial of Skillshare. More on that later on in the video. So without further ado, let's talk about some orcs. So I started this project the way I start a lot of projects, and that is with my base mesh. Um, you know, just to get up and running really quickly. And the first order of business in this case, obviously, would be to make this guy look more orc shaped. I am also working on a version of my base mesh for release. So stay tuned for that if you are in the market for base meshes or you just want to use the same base meshes that I do. But yeah, the first thing to do in any kind of big character project is the block out. And that's this first pass, a first run at the whole character. And you really try to scope out everything you need. So you try to get all the meshes and elements you think you're going to need to finish the character sketched out and laid out so that you can start to work on the whole character as a whole. That's how I like to work is so I can start to iterate on the whole character at the same time. Just trying to do it real fast. You can see I'm already in the expression. So I have a clear idea of where I'm headed here. Okay, so I thought I would show you my reference board that I made for this project. And we can dive in here and I can show you, you know, some stuff. But you can see here, it like generally starts with this mashup, you know, a little bit of mood and then uh, there's some actual specific reference. So you can see this is an awesome CG orc um, that I've been a fan of for a long time. Got some skin reference over here. So here are the Warcraft orcs from the cinematics. I think this one's really good. Uh, lighting is great too. And then uh, this awesome uh, life-size orc by Steve Wang and his company. And then we got Lurts. Yeah, big old Lurts. This is kind of near the scene where I was thinking of this Grimace. Um, but anyways, you can see how I have uh, a bunch of different things, some orc designs that I just think are great uh, for one reason or another. I love this orc from The Hobbit, you know, all CG and just love the beat up wonky metal. Here's some embarrassing images of me making the stupid face for reference. But, you know, when you're doing faces, I mean, use what you got, you know, I mean, I've got a camera here so I can actually even record video and make the expression so I can see the skin and the face move, which is really important. Um, got some other references here too of this facial pose, but it kind of does help me to like get in the character and do it. And then I look at what my face did to try to get the right vibe, you know, but this is kind of the area of my reference board for that expression. Uh, here's our first one. I actually recaptured it. Um, here's the first one with the chin out a lot. Really wanted that chin out kind of look, you know, but I guess I scooted it away because I didn't like it. And this one kind of looks like I'm like in pain, like I stubbed my toe. Maybe that's not the vibe. I'm going for here's the um, Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, the actual costume. It's the chain mail that I was really interested in seeing. Um, so that's why I have this reference in here. We'll talk more about chain mail. Uh, yeah, some more 
references of the actual pose I ended up going with. So this is my reference board for the project. Uh, I, I, I kind of work on this as I go on too. I start, this is the first thing I'll do at the start of a project. So I, I start in the center here, kind of radiate out. You can see like these islands kind of form later. Like here's the mouth, here's the armor, anatomy, facial expression, pose. Um, so it just kind of organically happens that way. But as I go through the project, I'll, I'll need more detailed reference. Like I don't get this reference of tongues in the beginning. But then when I start working on the tongue, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, what's what's a tongue look like up close? And I start adding that. And this becomes, you know, an island of itself eventually. So that's generally how it goes. Everyone's got their own way to do reference. This is pure ref, by the way. Uh, I love this for doing, for using it for reference. So I always recommend that to everybody. But yeah, that's my reference board. So now let's get back to making orcs. All right, back to our orc. So I'm going to start making some meshes for the armor. See, I'm just drawing out a mask. That's uh, that's going to be used a lot to make all different kinds of pieces. So just drawing a quick mask, um, extracting it, and then making it one plane, slicing it up using Z remesh. So you'll see I do that on many pieces. For the belt, I just used the insert curve strap brush uh, in ZBrush. So that comes standard too. And yeah, then so I can just get up and running. And something I'm going to be using a lot is the sub D preview workflow in ZBrush. So that's a way for me to see the meshes smoothed right here. Boom. I just enabled it. So now I can see the mesh while it's smoothed, but I'm not actually dividing. But here, let's go through the process. So here we go. I painted a mask, made a rough shape, sliced it up so it's clean mirrored it. So now I can Z remesh it. I did Z remesh several times to make it as simple as possible. Uh, didn't get what I wanted. So I sliced it to make more polygroups. And I said, Hey, keep these polygroups. So that's a way for me to control the topology. So that's how I went about making that mesh, you know, rather quickly, which I can extrude and duplicate and turn into other stuff. So this is all part of that block out phase. I'm trying to get up and running really fast, trying to get all of the meshes there and ready to go. So I can work on the character as a whole. So also you can see as a part of the block out phase, uh, I actually just roughed in some hair um, using the curve multi-tube mesh. You'll see me here go up to the picker and choose constant Z so I can draw on the surface. That's a little tip that people uh, tend to forget. So I can just draw right on the surface and then I'm just making strips, deleting the curve, split. I'm splitting off the unmasked part, deleting the curve. So I'm just using this to generate tubular meshes fast that I can position. So this is actually wasted work. I'm not gonna use this for anything, but it was just helpful for me to get a rough model of the hair. So I'm just putting it in there to help inform me of the overall character and personality while I'm working. And then later I'm kind of using that when I do my fiber mesh guide. So it's just there to help give me an impression while I work. So also something I'm doing in the block out stage here is with these armor pieces and leather pieces, I'm trying to keep them one plane thin because it's best and easiest to adjust it. I can always adjust the topology. So what I do is I utilize the thickness in the subdiv preview. So you can see right here, I hit D on the keyboard to check it out and I go over to the thickness and I start adding thickness. So this is somewhat of a new feature in ZBrush, but not only am I able now to preview the subdivision, but I'm also able to preview it with thickness. And so I have creased edges on all the parts that I want to stay sharp. And you can see me doing it here on the uh, neck guard piece too. So I do this with all the armor pieces. I do it with the leather pieces. And it's just a way for me to, you know, be able to revise and iterate in the model without committing to subdivisions or anything like that. All right, so the gloves pretty easy. I just used the actual hand topology and just ripped off the hands as duplicates. And here I am starting to sculpt in some anatomy. Also, you can see my little tiny baby hands now. I scaled them down to uh, not interfere with the glove. So they look a little silly, but uh, roughing in the anatomy here with um, maybe the damn standard brush or a standard brush to carve in some lines. Then you see I work on the volumes with the clay buildup brush. That's always been my brush of choice for doing sculpture work really like you know to try to control forms you can see how i lay strips sometimes i'll lay strips perpendicular to the form or along the form but this is uh, my general workflow just kind of sketching in lines figuring out where things are gonna go and then uh, trying to refine the forms using clay buildup 
So I'm going to come back to these arms. They're, you know, by no means going to be finished. I'm just trying to get them to a level, checking it with the rest of the character and just because they're going to be shown, but I'm not trying to waste too much time. So here I am back at the glove using the mask to like start this wrinkle. So, you know, this kind of stuff is a mix of reference that I find and also um, just trying to sell the material on my model. So, you know, sometimes I'll just be trying to flow with what forms are there try to reinforce like where it would wrinkle and whatnot. So again, a lot of damn standard and then the standard brush with a little chisel, but just drawn in the seams and everything. So here is uh, the leather waist piece. I wanted to show that, um, you know, sometimes I just got to go in there and do some modeling. So to get a nice clean edge, like a loop, a ring that goes around the edge, I'm actually just extruding out the edges and then with Z modeler going in there and welding it, deleting edges and moving it out so this is like kind of typical modeling not something that you would like normally do in zbrush but it's nice to just be able to do it in zbrush but this is a way for me to turn a z remeshed mesh into you know a pretty good mesh that subdivides the way i want and it can maintain those uh, corners there so it's a relatively good flow and most of it was auto generated also using Z modeler quite a bit here on this piece to make this belt loop. So uh, I use Z modeler to make these little poly groups. I used inset to inset the rectangles in there, extruded it out, deleted the faces. Now I'm bridging these and then I'm going to insert some edge loops. So uh, heavily relied on Z modeler to do that. It's nice to be able to do this kind of thing in ZBrush and that's how I made the belt loops. So once the topology is good, I can give it thickness, I can extrude it, and then in this case, I'm going to actually subdivide it so I can start sculpting. So uh, in my armor piece, there's a little bit of like a wrinkle in the middle. I use the masking tool to draw that out, and then I start sculpting in the leather. Sculpting leather has always been really fun for me. What's fun about making leather is the beating it up. So you can see now I'm starting to use my skin brushes to just start adding these like fine wrinkles and creases. I mean, leather is skin, so, you know, you can use any kind of brushes you want, but these kind of like fine line brushes I use to just scatter stuff. Then now I'm coming over and reinforcing these wrinkles with the damn standard brush. So if you put some of these details at lower subdivisions too, they'll look more soft, you know, like it's thick leather that's getting kind of memory folds. And then as you go up, you make these sharp wrinkles. Um, so these type of like fine lines plus like just beating it up, uh, it just looks cool. You know, I think the reason why, um, leather's fun is that it's really forgiving too. I mean, there's no wrong answer really. You just, if you just keep working on it, it ends up beating up the mesh and, and looking more and more organic. So having things be soft sometimes, having things be a little uneven, it's good. So you can see right now how I did these like leather skirt bits. I started by saving a morph target and then I just with the skin fine wrinkles brush sprayed it everywhere at a couple different resolutions and now with the morph brush i can come back in here and like remove some uh and now you get this like really complicated you know detail in a pretty quick way and then here just dot net some damage on the edges okay so uh, another thing i do is i'll do the stitch detail using a brush lazy mouth uh nice to get this kind of tight stitching detail and then what's fun is going back over this with brushes and stuff to beat it up. You can see I'm even making it wonky like on purpose, right? And then putting more of those memory wrinkles in there and kind of reinforcing that it's being stitched. And overall it's fun, you can't really go wrong. You're just, you're just beating up the surface and that's what I think is really cool about leather. All right, so for the armor, what I did to start out with to break it up after I committed to subdivisions, so this is not preview anymore, this is actually subdivided. And then I come into the surface tab and I started playing with different noise. I saved a morph target before, which I'm always trying to do, and you should always be doing that. And that'll let me remove it. So I'm just playing around here with noise, hitting it, uh, reapplying it so that it's even stronger, and then just going over everything with my morph brush so I can knock it back here and there. So now most of the time that I'm sculpting, I'm just dinging things up. Here I have the trim dynamic brush. I'm just going over the edges, which is really fun to do. After I apply the noise too, it has like kind of different angles that the trim dynamic brush is going to flatten down. So it helps me make things look chipped and dinged. And that's what I'm going for. I just want it to look, you know, like, like it was handmade to begin with. And then it's been th through some battles. So imperfection is the name of the game. So I just want to keep working on it. So it doesn't look like a perfect 3d model and it just looks more and more messed up. 
I'm also using trim dynamic like on the surface as you see here and that kind of helps that like hammered look and also just variation you know trying to be mindful that I'm not leaning on procedurals which can look artificial I'm I'm layering procedurals and then with by hand I'm going in and like flattening some regions moving some other things so that's going to help me like break symmetry and and make the surface like you see you see here I'm just like inflating uh, I'll use the move brush whatever so here what I just did is I just did a cavity mask again I stored a morph target uh, beforehand and now I'm dinging in like pretty strong so this way I'm going to get these like big kind of dings or chips or something a da damage essentially and then with that morph brush I can come in here and take out all the things that I don't want so I get these like organic shapes and that ju this just happened naturally by picking up the cavity of the noise that I already made so when I'm done I'm left with just a few little organic spots you know, I don't want it to be too much, but I just want to help it look like it's been eroded maybe, or maybe it's part of damage or something. Now I'm coming in and trying to actually carve out this little like hero dent here on the side, bringing up the edge. So making a sharp edge there now adding scratches. This is super fun, you know, with the damn standard coming in here to make a sharp edge, but also making like these metallic scratches. There's a scratch along the front. There we go. Trying some other scratches and then sometimes hitting undo, just seeing how they look. Um, not trying to be too precious. You know, I mean, uh, it's, you know, if they've been in battle, just damage is going to happen where it happens, you know, so I'm trying not to get too crazy about it, but definitely trying to distribute it in an organic way so it doesn't feel artificial. So I, I added these little uh, rivets to all over the costume. I think this tiny little detail helps bring it scale and uh, believability. So that's always something to pay attention to. Same process here, just going to speed through it, but like the other armor pieces too. Once I got the process down, I did the same thing. Morph target, layering the noise, starting to manipulate it. Now I'm just doing the chips on the edges, so bigger dings and stuff. Again, now with the orbs brush, doing a scratch crack type stuff. Doing it along the front too, so it's noticeable. It helps break symmetry again. I don't know why, but for some reason doing the scratches is like the most satisfying part. I love making the edges look, you know, really irregular too. That's helping the handmade, hand-beaten metal look. You can see here how I had to make the other armor pieces um, using Z Modeler, and then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take it all the way through the same process that I did the original armor pieces. So once I know the process, that's generally, you know, something a part of my workflow is uh, I'll figure out some sort of recipe that's working for the character. I might experiment, you know, on an individual piece, and then once I got something down, a look. Um, then I'll start to repeat it on the rest of the character. I use Z Modeler to make these uh, simple pieces that I extruded to to make these like bent um, pieces of metal that are like knives. So using age polish, trim dynamic. Again, I layered the noise and then just trying to add that organic randomness. Um, this is something I'm doing too. If you, if you notice, I have the snake hook with a spray. And so I'm just jiggling the surface and that's to make it look like it's it bent and warped again adding so much imperfection and then i'm going to come in here with the uh trim dynamic brush maybe the h polish brush and just go over edges and like hit them to sharpen them uh, that's something i think is going to be really important so you see here i'm zooming in starting to make this chiseled sharpened look because these should look like dangerous and like knives and stuff you know so once i have this really irregular metal surface then coming in here and like polishing and sharpening edges is going to help give it contrast and make it look a lot more sharp and catch the light. So that's how I made the armor. All right. So back to the face. So like I said, I kind of started with the expression. I already knew it. I had it in mind, like what I was going to do. So just refining the sculpt, uh, you see me bouncing around, but now I'm starting to focus a little bit more on, you know, bringing it forward and resolving some of these forms and stuff. Once I'm happy generally with the face now, like I think the character or personality is in a pretty good spot, uh, I'm going to move on to detail. Just adding his badass nose ring right here. You know, he's got to get that jewelry if he's going to be at Warcraft work, you know? And I feel like this bull, like, septum piercing is uh, makes a lot of sense. I actually just stole that from his belt buckle to start with, too. But yeah, once the sculpt is in a pretty good spot, um, and I'm you know, fairly happy with my 
primary and secondary forms, the general shape of them. Then I start with the details. So I did the HD geometry workflow here again. So you see, uh, I actually divided it five times in the, um, you know, standard subdivisions and then an additional three in HD to get it pretty big. So you see when I hit A on the keyboard here to like enter HD, it's a somewhat small window. So rather than uh, have a tiling pore map, I'm actually just going to place all the pores with my uh, brushes. I'm just going to, I'm just going to place all the pores on there. All the pores. Doing it this way takes time for sure. Um, but you know, I, uh, I like the quality. I get more resolution this way. The reason is, uh, the window is small is because of how many polygons there's like a limit to how many polygons it can even display. So I did do HD, but you know, I'm limited to this window. So rather than like stitch together a bunch of tiling ones, I thought I'll just do this by hand, you know? So, you know, ultimately it doesn't take like that much time. It's just a little bit more manual labor, but you know, I like the results, so I don't, I don't mind doing it. Just listen to some tunes or whatever and just grind it out. And that's the first thing is I lay down like a bed of pores. After the pores are laid down, then I can start adding these fine wrinkles. You see me doing here above the brow. This is a really satisfying part for me too, because this is sort of the uh, reinforcing what's physically happening in the face. So this, I think this helps the believability that I'm adding wrinkles uh, where the skin would be stretching or compressing in the expression. And just the more I add breakup and variety to the surface of the skin, it looks more and more organic and it really brings the character to life, which informs me again to go back and, and start manipulating it. So I feel really good once I get to this spot and then I can just keep reworking it. And once I get my first pass at doing the sculpt with the detail, uh, I like to just make a quick test scene in Maya so I can see what it looks like in Arnold with, you know, a, a subsurface shader. So like here's some of my early test renders, just seeing what it looks like. It's kind of a sanity check and to break the ice, you know, because at this point I've been working for hours without seeing it in its final form. So this helps me like realize uh, what I need to do in ZBrush to push the character more uh, how I want it to feel in its final form. I also wanted to just briefly touch on this notion of paying attention and modeling details. Uh, something I try to do in my work when it makes sense. And for this character, you know, he's a very simple design. So the textures and materials are obviously going to be important in, in keeping interest on those big areas. But also paying special attention to like this belt buckle we're seeing right here. Which I also thought was an opportunity to kind of mash up this Lord of the Rings and, and Blizzard kind of homages. And... Uh, Things like the buckles on the shin guards, uh, those rivets that we saw, all the way down to, you know, the texture detail. But paying attention to some of these little parts that might become focal points in your final images, something that might, you know, catch someone's interest, or maybe you want to do a detail shot. Just dotting a few of those around at work kind of bring up the overall impression of the quality or the level of detail, just to spend, you know, more time on a couple little pieces like this. All right, so the UV mapping. Uh, here I am doing some boring UV mapping. Just doing it quick, you know, not caring too much. I just need it to be flat. Uh, this is very much like a CG render workflow, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to care about it like it's production. One of the big things I wanted to do with this project, though, was utilize the UDIM workflow in Substance Painter. For those that don't know, UDIM is the use of multiple UV tiled coordinates instead of just zero to one. So it lets me use multiple textures for a material, uh, which simplifies the process and adds a lot more pixels. And so since I'm a game artist and I'm limited, you know, normally for work, I thought it'd be really fun to just throw a ton of pixels at something and be able to do, you know, kind of what I'm comfortable doing in Substance Painter, but at a much higher resolution. So here I am unwrapping this stuff in Maya. Um, I'm actually just using that FBX that I exported uh, in my Maya scene now. So I'm just um, going to UV these. And then I'm going to have to re-import these models in ZBrush to apply those UVs if I want to make changes. So I'm, I'm 
making sure I'm going to do that to update my Z tool with all this UV information I'm doing right now. But yeah, just making seams and, unf and flattening stuff, pretty basic, using unfold, nothing too crazy. So here you can see all my UDIM tiles so far, multiple tiles, and the idea is that these will all be 4K. So right now, just arranging them in the different rows. That way I can separate like which material is what, just visually. Here you see me exporting the high poly version of the orc as an FBX. I've named all my sub tools on the right, as you can see. They all have the name of the mesh plus the suffix high. And this export's gonna take forever, so I'm gonna cut that out. But you know, I'm, I'm exporting a ton of polygons right now. And this will be my high poly source mesh in Substance Painter. And then I'm exporting all the meshes that I just unwrapped uh, from Maya. So now booting up Substance Painter, starting a fresh new scene, and then I'm selecting the metallic roughness preset to get going. We can change that later. And then I'm gonna choose that bake FBX that we just exported, and then I'll hook up the high in the source meshes. Also at the start of the scene, I have to be sure that I enable use UV tile workflow right here, because that's what I want. I wanna use them fat, sweet, juicy UDIMs. All right, so now I'm gonna load up the high poly, change the suffix names, and then set it by mesh name. That's why I named everything high and low, so I can get a clean bake. So I'm doing a quick test bake at a low resolution to make sure everything's good. It looks good to me, so then I'm gonna do a high quality bake at full res, which is gonna take a while. So now hitting the bake button and showing it on turbo, brrr, baked. All right, now taking a closer look at these crispy deets. Um, the head normal map I'm going to get from Zebra, so don't worry about that. But scooch around, finding a problem in the UVs, unfortunately, there with the buckle. But everything else looks pretty good uh, resolution-wise. So I'm going to fix that, any kind of errors that I find, and then move on to the texturing. All right, so like on a separate day, I had made this Orc Armor Smart Material. So I just spent time up front. You know, before I knew exactly what I wanted to do, I, I knew I wanted to make this sort of material to use in this project anytime I need some kind of beat up armor. So you can see here in the layer stack, like some of the stuff I did, we could talk about Substance Painter tutorials and stuff, but just want to show you, I did invest in making this smart material first. And then in the project, I started assigning that to the armor bits. I can edit the smart material as I need be. Same thing with the leather. I used some of the smart materials that come with substance and mixed in a little bit of my own. But that's the first step is just applying these materials or really these folders full of layers onto the different uh, parts of the mesh, creating the masks. And then once the whole scene is kind of built out, then it's just like tons of time iterating and then um, and then some really satisfying part, which is painting things by hand, you know, like fading the leather or adding and removing um, damage or storytelling or whatever, but actually like with a, you know, with a pen and sitting down and doing it with your hand, which is cool. But in the beginning, you're really like setting up the scene um, and making sure you have all the layers and the tools that you need so that you can start painting. Speaking of painting, something I thought was uh, kind of cool. Eventually, I was trying to figure out like something to, interesting to do with the skin. And if you notice in my references, I had a couple of these orcs with this like um, kind of noisy pattern on their skin. So I ended up making this quote unquote vertiglio uh, folder with some stuff. And you can see I have like warp and levels and all this like clouds and stuff. And uh, ultimately, it let me have a paint layer so I could actually paint in and out and get these uh, complex shapes. So uh, I was, you know, I thought that was a pretty successful little effect there. And um, I layered things on the skin to end up breaking it up even more with color. And then another thing I did on the skin that I like to do a lot is uh, use some curvature to get the cavities a little bit darker, a little bit rougher. And then I added some super fine noise to the base color. I think having a um, sharp detail, subtle detail, but lots of detail in your base color is a good way to bring life to character renders all right so it continued on texturing for a while but then uh, it's important to export and get set up in arnold is what i'm doing right but any renderer that you're using it's important to start making the exports and get the link going because i iterate i do exports like multiple times a day so what i did was i edited my own export settings just to give me what i wanted in terms of the naming and the right channels uh, everything that I wanted and packed the way that I'd like for this particular character. And then I hit export 
and we're doing that UDIM workflow. So every time I click export, it exports 70 4K textures. Mm, spicy, dude. So that was pretty fun. Um, you know, that was that was one of the main objectives of this project was to be able to use this UDIM workflow and to use really high resolution textures. So multiple, multiple 4K textures. So I could just kind of paint to my heart's content. Uh, and that was pretty successful. I have a pretty old machine. If you guys didn't notice already, I've got like a 2017 computer. It's not the best in the world. And uh, it was still able to handle it pretty fine. Not blazing fast, but pretty good. So I, I would recommend the Substance Workflow if uh, you're interested in that. I think they did a pretty good job. So once I export, I hooked up the materials in Arnold. I did that tutorial before on the kind of special things you got to do to make sure textures coming out of Substance are hooked up correctly. But once they are, then I get the basic scene roughed out. And now that it's set up, I can check it in the actual renderer and then kind of figure out what I want to change, what I want to update to make it better. Then I'll go back to Substance, I'll work on it some more, re-export and update those textures and then see what my update looks like in Arnold. And like I say, that's part of my, it's always part of my process so that I can refine it in its final form. So I do try to get that set up uh, relatively soon once all the materials are blocked out before I do a lot of finishing and I'm exporting and updating, you know, I don't know, 10 times at least, um, a night, just, you know, going back and doing a bunch of work, checking it. Um, so there's really no limit to that. And I think, uh, finally getting your, your final setup for me anyway, is super important, you know, because the whole time you're kind of working with blinders on a little bit, if you're not in your final renderer, also don't neglect hand painting details. Um, it's kind of, uh, easy to lean too much on all the procedural tools in substance painter. So be sure to be painting to that. Just the, just the nature of you doing things by hand is going to make things look more organic. Also added this little birthmark. This is from Lertz in Lord of the Rings. And I kind of uh, transplanted it here on my orc. I was kind of thinking of him like Lertz. You can see I did the white hand too. Here I am updating the tongue texture. So this is kind of an example of, I went pretty far along and realized, Hey, I don't have enough work here. I don't have enough detail in the tongue. I'm, I'm going to need to do something there. So you can see, I already have the Arnold scene set up. I already have the substance scene set up, but that doesn't mean it's too late for me to update a mesh if I feel like it's worth it. So I just update that mesh, replace the high poly, do another bake. And again, that's kind of part of the process. So I'm not trying to feel locked in, but I am trying to move forward. So I, here I am painting that white hand of Saruman right here. I went a couple of different ways with this. Obviously I just hand paint the, the hand right here. What I ended up doing though, to get it in um, Arnold and to look a little bit more interesting, a little bit more believable, is I had this actually be a custom mask. So when I'm exporting these textures, it actually spits out uh, an alpha mask essentially of this white hand that I painted. And then in Arnold, I use that to drive a layered shader so that the actual white hand, you see me setting it up right here. The actual white hand is a different material so I don't make it a skin shader. So it's like a dielectric shader. It's like a plastic -y, you know, I'm trying to make it look like paint essentially, but because it's not subsurface and I give it a little bit of height, you know, I'm really trying to push that material contrast and make it look like it's a new, another material on top of the skin. Dialing in the tongue now, I got my new updates that I did that I told you I ran through the process with, but also I'm mixing it with that noise that I always like to mix on stuff. That's how I got the crispy details on the tongue. I use that alligator AI cell noise, cranked it up to get some pads here. You can go too far, but end up making it look like a cat tongue or something, but uh, was happy to do that too. I'm always satisfied to see tiny crispy details like that. All right. So I thought the tusk little jewelry ring thing could use a little bit of something. I thought it was kind of boring and it was a good opportunity for maybe a little Easter egg because I wanted to put an inscription on there. So I went to a black speech of Mordor translator website yeah, I did that and I said that right now. And I typed in Blizzard. And then what came up, I put into this Kirk High or the AKA Mordor runes table. And I just used each letter and I did the corresponding rune. Now, is that the right way to do it? I don't know, but it got these cool Mordor runes and then I put them on the tusk. So I just sketched it in with red ink first on a simple layer. And then I used that to um, make a depression with the height channel. And then I used uh, an anchor to pick that up in the grime 
to, uh, you know, finish texturing, get some like gunk in there and stuff. But ultimately I'm happy with how it came out. You know, is it readable by anybody? No. Uh, but I think it helps it look orcish and Lord of the Rings, you know, using these symbols of Mordor. So ultimately I'm pretty happy how it came out. And that's my little, uh, little Easter egg. If you've made it to this point in the video and you're still awake, drop a pogom in the chat. Where are my nerds at? All right, so let's talk about some hair. Uh, so here I am starting off with fiber mesh. I'm using a preset of mine that I made just for guides. Uh, you can get that for free if you're interested in doing this sort of thing too. Um, this is a question I got pretty common. I always get questions about hair, but because I was going fiber mesh to Maya, people wanted to know a little bit more about that. I'll probably make a video specifically on that thing down the road, but the gist here is that I use fiber mesh to style these curves that will become my guide curves in uh, Maya. And the reason I do that is I find it easier to manipulate a bunch of curves at once using the ZBrush groom tools. I think it's one of the best ways to use fiber mesh, honestly. And this uh, hairstyle I knew was going to be, you know, somewhat complicated in, in terms of like the direction and everything, the style. So here I am about to export these curves, um, exporting the file, and then I'm going to change the file format to MA and then name it whatever I want. And this is going to make curves. So in Maya, I'm now going to import that MA. It'll bring in all my curves and then I can um, use XGen's tools to make those guide curves. All right, so here are all the curves. In Maya now, you can see it brings in a group full of curves. Resolution is not great, um, but that's okay. I also am going to continue to style it once it's in here. But uh, I'm going to create a description now, then select all my curves. And you can see in the description now, in the utilities, there's a curves to guides function. And you can also go guides to curves. So you can do a lot of tricky stuff in here in terms of translating. But here you see they're orange. That means they're guide curves. So there you go. Now I got a ton of guide curves and I started that with ZBrush. Uh, I also loaded one of my previous grooms. Um, I save all my grooms that I've been doing as presets um, just so I can get all of the, you know, all of the modifiers, all the little things that I've done to start with. So I'm not starting from scratch. And, uh, and that's what I did to get going. So that way I don't have to do it all again. So that way I don't have to do it all again. And it gives me some place to jump off from. So here's the scalp. I duplicate the head mesh and use it as a scalp. And then I move the UVs because I am using UDIMs. But little tip, you know, XGen can't use UDIMs. So I had to repack the scalp mesh so that it was all in zero to one. Then I painted that quick mask where the hair needs to be. And then there you go, uh, pretty fast setup. I mean, you can see here it's got the modifiers. Um, so I'll have to go in and, and rechange some stuff. I'm also gonna use some custom noise and stuff to get some more complicated uh, clumps and everything. But all in all, I think this is a good overall workflow for making hair quickly. Here you go, you can see now it looks like an orc in a Pantene commercial. Okay, hear me. Uh, here's me doing some clumping. Now you see all the hair going through the ear right there? Uh, that's a problem. And here I'm trying to fix it using uh, what's called region maps. You can see I keep trying and I'm like, ah, I just can't get the hair to peel back. And then I realize, you know what? I need to just make separate descriptions for all these pieces of hair. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually splitting it up. And that's kind of my big tip. That's my one of my biggest takeaways from this project, honestly, is this idea of like when doing a hairstyle, because it just dawned on me that it'd be simpler if I had a description for the top part like this. And I then I made a description for the front parts that are in front of the ears. And then I made a description for the the hair that goes behind the ear. I made a description for the ponytail. So I really broke it up. Uh I don't really have experience using action and productions like, you know, cinematics and film and stuff, but I have a hunch that this is what they do too. I don't see any downside of doing it. It actually even kind of worked out that I built a single description and then what I did is I split it up, right? But what I did was I duplicated it. Um, so the work that I had made in the groom uh, carried over. So that might even be a good workflow. Um, if not, then maybe saving as a preset, just so you don't have to do all the clumping and set up, you know, multiple times. But so that's what I did. 
I'm working on the top part right here. Again, I did a little trick, you know, I made a ponytail like holder and I made sure it was like rock and roll, you know, freaking orc metal uh, ponytail holder. And then uh, the ponytail itself is a separate description. So give me the most control. Let me make uh, the hairstyle look exactly like I wanted and uh, making separate descriptions. It's the pro move. So obviously I had to do some eyelashes too. I, I opted to not do um, eyebrows eventually. I didn't do eyebrows the whole time. When I found, when I was looking at orc pictures, there was eyebrows and no eyebrows. I actually did a version with eyebrows, which I'll show you right now. Cha -cha. But I, I asked some people and like I just, you know, the Lord of the Rings orcs didn't have eyebrows. So I was like, you know what? No eyebrows. Uh, but I did the stubble and then I also did a groom for the shoulder pad. So a lot of groom, a lot of grooming. I actually even added groom to the arms to make hairy arms because I felt that was pretty orcish too. So yeah, the most grooming of any of the projects I've done so far, but I just couldn't resist making this free armor pad. I thought it would be cool. And you can see here using some custom noise to make the clumps kind of irregular, adding a lot of noise to it. And then uh, you see how it looks all evenly cut and then adding a cut modifier and like randomizing those lengths really help shear the tips and then uh, just add more and more breakup. I added some kind of curves. I looked at some references, kind of like a yak hair or something like that. You know what I mean? It's just like matted and dirty and, uh, you know, clumped. And I wanted the clumps to be irregular. One of the things I was struggling with, honestly, was it being confused with his hair on his head, which still might be the case, but I just didn't want to do anything but black for both. So, you know, that's just kind of a byproduct. But I tried to make it as different as possible uh, in the groom. And then also I made it very dry rather than his gross wet hair. So yeah, that's what I did for the armor pad. Hairy arms, hairy arms were just placing and grooming guides and then, uh, you know, making some wispy burly man arms. That's kind of what I was going for. All right, let's talk about chain mail for a minute. I uh, got this question several times about how I did the chain mail and uh, how you can do stuff like chainmail. So it's it's with nano mesh. So here I am using Z modeler, going over to a face and saying, insert nano mesh at every polygon. And then I'm just selecting this uh, chainmail mesh. This is like a free brush you can get online, maybe at the art station marketplace, I'm not sure. But it wasn't giving me what I wanted. So here you see me trying to edit that mesh. Um, you know, not everyone's a Lord of the Rings nerd like me, but I'm trying to get that Lord of the Rings chainmail, which was cut from plastic pipe. And so that makes these like flat uh, discs. And I really like the look of the chainmail. I'm trying to emulate that. So I kind of just go down this crazy rabbit hole uh, and it melts my brain. So you see, I'm just going to show you some of the crazy configurations I was getting into. I ended up, you know, having to model it from scratch instead of using that brush and I just tried um, a bunch of different configurations and you can see here like it's already like pretty complicated and then um, I'm like yeah that'll work so I test it out come into ZBrush uh, run nano mesh again and use this new um, mesh in an insert brush I made so here I am aligning it scaling it I'm like wait that's weird you know I'm missing a ring uh, so I'm like alright I can fix that I go back here and, I, and this goes on for hours probably here i am i updated the mesh re-exported it importing it again gonna try to assign this whoop doesn't look right it's not perfect so here is the final mesh looks pretty simple i don't know why this took me so long it took me so long multiple days you know like i tried and failed and finally this is the final mesh that ended up uh giving me what i wanted so anyways now that i have that brush i came in here the second uh, important part was the orientation. So you see here, it's important that the mesh you're using for nano mesh is evenly distributed so that you can tell, so you can't tell that it's stretched because it needs to, it's putting a mesh at every face. And then using Z modeler, I click spin edges and I came in here and I actually spun them. So you can use the nano mesh parameters here to automatically do an orientation. So I did that until most of it was right. But to really get what I wanted, which was for the sleeve to all flow in one direction and the rest of it to flow in another so it really looks, uh, you know, like it has like a seam around the shoulder and it doesn't look all random, I had to go in here and click these faces. 
uh, one by one. So it took a little bit. It took me a while to even figure out that that's what I would do. But once it was done and the orientations were all right, then I can show you. So if I scale them so that they interlink and then I divide the mesh, boom. Then I, uh, I get all the details. So that's how I did the, the chain mail. It was important to have the right mesh that tiled correctly. And then the orientation was important. And I ended up having to do that face by face. Um, but that was it. Then I have a, a you know, this mesh is also live once you have nano mesh. So you can like move the underlying mesh around. So once it's done, you can go down to the inventory and you're ready to like make this for real. You click this button that says one to mesh. And then it creates a sub tool where it's not live anymore. It's actually just all geo. And then so if I um, hide the underlying mesh, I'm left with just the chain mail. And that's it. I think I might have set this to divide once in Arnold so that it's smooth. I did have supporting edges. But here I just threw on a metal material so you could see it. But yeah, that's how I did the chain mail. And for texturing, I used uh, Substance Source. Again, just browse the library. Try to find a metal with some breakup and some interest. Uh, you can't UV something like this because it's just too many polygons. And, it, you know, I tried. It's just crazy. So I just ended up doing triplanar projecting in Arnold. So to just throw textures at it, that way I could break it up, make it look a little less perfect and uh, all without having to do UVs. So his sword, our homie orc needed a sword. Um, I had to squeeze that in. I, I knew he needed it and uh, just didn't really pay too much attention to it. So just one night I set aside and, uh, and knocked it out and went through the whole workflow or pipeline again. So I made a high poly and then I auto generated the topology and UVs because who cares? And then I baked it and textured it, used the same orc armor smart material to start with. Uh, and then, you know, busted it up and everything and then added it to Arnold, made sure the materials were good. And then I could put it in his hand, do some renders. So that's the sword. All right. So then it came time to pose this guy. So I used transpose master in ZBrush. It's in the plugin menu. And this is the way I use most of the time to pose characters. It just merges all of your sub tools together and it lets you position everything all at once. It's very much the modeler's way of posing and it just lets you skip doing rigs. So that's what I did. I had an idea of where I was going to, or how I was going to pose this, you know, for pretty much the length of the project. Obviously I knew the facial expression and you saw my reference board that I have a general idea of the pose that I wanted. So I just saved a different Z tool. So I'm not overriding it. I took time to pose it in transpose master. And then when it comes to updating the scene in Maya, I just had to re export all these meshes. And for the most part, I would just delete the original mesh and then bring in this pose one and, the, and apply the same shader because it has the UVs, you know, I updated it and everything. So I'm just swapping them except for the head. Now, another question I got uh, quite a bit was how did I update the groom on the pose? Like how did the hair stick to the mesh? That's actually pretty easy because XGen is made to work with animations. So what I'm doing is I'm just using blend shapes in Maya. So if you remember, there's two meshes, there's a head mesh and then there's a scalp mesh. That's what the X-Gen is attached. So I'm bringing in the new posed head and I'm applying that as a blend shape to both the head and the scalp. And then I'm cranking that blend shape up. So the vert positions all snap to the new posed position and the hair just sticks to the head. It's made to stick with blend shapes, obviously, because it's made to do animations and stuff. So that's how I update meshes. That's for all projects. That's how I update the head that has grooms on it or displacement, any kind of mesh that has a lot of info on it that I don't have to reset up. I just use blend shapes to update the model as I work on it over time. All right, so now that it's posed, it was time to do the final setups and render out the final images. So what I usually do is do multiple setups. I definitely knew I was going to do a portrait, you know, sort of shot here. And then I tried to get a little bit creative, try some different angles. If you see at the bottom here, I have uh, five keyframes. So what I'll do is I'll set keyframes for the camera. Uh, I'll put multiple lighting setups if I want different lighting setups. Like maybe I'll have uh, folders, uh, groups, and then I'll actually keyframe the visibility. Maybe I'll rotate the whole group whatever you got to do. And I'll put it all on a keyframe. And I do this so that I can just do a batch like render sequence and get those images out. So I was experimenting with lighting, um, color positioning, framing, obviously just making sure things look nice. And once I did, uh, I set the renders to render with enough sampling to get a low amount of noise. 
And so after I made those final images, I sent them over to Nuke, which we should get into right after we talk about this video sponsor, Skillshare. So I got a lot of things going on in uh, in my life, trying to keep it together. It's always a struggle. Uh, my brain is just a table with drawers spilled out onto it. I mean, it's a mess up here. So I'm just constantly writing stuff down, trying to get better at things. And you know what I think would help me uh, is this class here on productivity, okay, by Thomas Frank. So this guy's pretty cool. He's another YouTuber. Um, I mean, I say another like I'm in his league or whatever, but, you know, I look up to a lot of YouTubers. He's one of them. Uh, I've seen some of his videos on YouTube and I'm taking his class on productivity right now on Skillshare. So this is something that might be useful to all kinds of people. It's obviously not just catered to creative people. This is for organizing your work and life using different apps and stuff. He's kind of a productivity guru in a cool way. Learning how to be better at productivity and management is something that I'm you know, I've been working on for years, really um, managing yourself, managing your projects, I think is huge in being more productive and just less crazy. Honestly, like before I started writing everything down, I just ideas would come and go. I, don't, I would be stuck kind of, you know, running in place. And um, so, yeah, just writing things down and being more productive. I think you can never be too productive in terms of managing like there's so much stuff going on today so being able to utilize calendars and all these different apps and stuff to like give yourself a schedule and be more professional in a way that it works for you and doesn't feel like rigid uh is something that i'm always striving to be better at so someone like thomas frank i'm pretty excited to learn some of the tips from him because i think he's great at this he's got he runs a very clean tight ship it seems over there on his channel and everything that he does with his website so this is the perfect kind of thing for me, uh, for where I'm at. It might be something that you're interested in. And there's a ton of classes here on Skillshare that you can check out. This is just one of them, but not only creative arts, but things like photography, videography, and even productivity. So if you're interested in trying Skillshare and you're not a member already, click that link below to get a free trial. And you can watch some of these classes right now. Just watch some classes and get better at stuff. I mean, what, you know, what are you doing? All right, cool. Now let's talk about putting together the final image here we are in nuke so nuke was new to me on this project uh i'll say the reason i got nuke in the first place was just to do focusing so if you see here everything is crisp and sharp right and then we show the focus bam out of focus so this depth of field effect right here doing it in arnold looks great looks perfect you know it does look a tiny bit better uh than when you do it in nuke but Nuke's great. It's the best like 2D, you know, compositing version that I've seen that you can do depth of field like this. This allows me to do a ton more renders because doing creamy bokeh or depth of field in Arnold and doing it noise free takes maybe almost four times as long to do a render. So it's serious stuff. So uh, I just finally convinced myself to invest in Nuke uh, so I can do lots of other fun things, but really to save a bunch of time. So we're gonna go through uh, one of the comps. You can see here, I have this, you know, multiple comps in here. I've got my square ones. I got my super 4K ones. Uh, and then over here, I got my um, clay renders. I just did them all right here. And so we're gonna go through one of the trees and show you, you know, all the little nodes, what I'm doing to make an image. And that's pretty much what I'm doing for all the images. All right, so let's zoom in here. So what I got going on right here is the render straight out of Arnold. Uh, well, this is it because I showed you the focus. So here's the Arnold render. And when I rendered it out of Arnold, I had the Z depth embedded in the EXR and Newt can pick that up. And that's the reason why we're using it. So this just uh, changes like the crop. Uh, so a little geeky stuff here and I'm transforming it. But here you go, this is the first big step. Uh, it's positioning it, it's cropping it, and it's uh, doing the focus. So now we do a little bit of color correcting, a little bit of sharpening. Uh, here's the background. Let's let's maybe go over that. Open this a little bit. So here's the background. I just, you know, did some Google searching of fiery forests. The idea was I wanted to make the final composition of him like, there's a scene in The Hobbit that was maybe a little bit of an inspiration, but I just wanted to be like in like a war zone-y kind of you know, burning fantasy forest. I thought it'd be cool. I'm using the warm light in the render. Um, so I'm kind of tying all that all together. I even have a, a flame reflection in his eye. So, you know, trying to make it look like he's surrounded in fire. I thought it'd be very cool. So yeah, so here it is after the crop. And here is the background. I actually flipped it upside down for this one. Um, this is just moving in position. And then I'm 
obviously defocusing this too. You can see the awesome bokeh that you get, and this isn't even, you can get a lot more nerdy with this. I did make it a little bit oblong to help it look more photographic and not perfect. Um, but yeah, really the bokeh that you get from just doing a 2D defocus is pretty awesome. So I'm doing that to get some background separation, doing a little color correction on that. I did a color correction uh, on the render, you know, really just to turn the yellows into oranges kind of to match the fire. And so the, here's the foreground and the background blended together. All right, here we go. Now we're jumping down here. Um, I got some foreground elements, these embers. Again, probably just Googled, I'm not sure. Just got some embers and then uh, moved this one. And then I did some roto painting, which is just masking. So, you know, I got this, this is what I made. And this gets composited in the foreground. So we got a foreground, middle ground, background thing going on now. Then what I did is I added this little glow see that? It's kind of cool, right? So if we come in here, we can see what's going on. So here's it before, here's it after. So I just think this is adding more photographic irregularities. That's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to punch it up. Um, so along with the focus, along with these little fiery embers, I think things getting blown out uh, is a cool effect. Yeah, just trying to make it look like it just got overexposed because the fire is so bright and uh, making it, trying to make it look more hot. And then I added some grain. Nuke lets you just add grain. There's got like grain presets. So I'll come in here, show you before and after. So here's before the glow and the grain, and here's after. And this is so big. This is another reason why I'm adding grain, um, because this is a super high resolution image. So it helps things hold up. It's not something you're going to see. It helps like there is some noise in the hair, things like that. So I just, I, again, I think it helps make it look photographic. So this is the grain set to screen mode. So it's brightening it up a bit, and it also is making the grain a little bit um, less contrasty. So now it's pretty subtle, and then you can see the overall brightness of this image is getting brought up now. Looks a lot more exposed correctly, I think. Brighter is better, I think, in this case, because we have a lot of darks in here, so I'm trying to get this full range. Here's a little uh, interesting trick. I looked this up. This was to do some chromatic aberration. So you'd split out these channels. Here's green, here's red and blue and then you're transforming it. So you're actually just moving it a little bit and I'll show you the merge. So uh, what I'm doing here is chromatic aberration. For those that don't know, it's shifting the channels, the color channels. It's another phenomenon that happens in photography. Uh, you can actually see it here in the photographic element of an ember. There's, you see this green edge, right? So there it is, shifting it. You get some blue fringing. So this is just some nerdy pixel peeping stuff, but got to say, I was pretty stoked. I always love some chromatic aberration. So yeah, it's subtle. Here we can show you right here. So yeah, it's subtle. This is before and this is after. So it helps. You see this fringing, the colored fringing. Softens it up a bit too. Again, looks more photographic. So here you go. Here's the final composition. We got this cool bokeh in the background. This like looks like it's fire everywhere reflecting on them got some embers a little bit of chromatic aberration and some filmic noise and this is where we started so there you go and then you can see the scene here i've got my three big old renders here and then these are all of my renders i did some square renders of of everything else so as an example here's another one straight out of arnold and then here's our final so you can see the final's got some color correction going on um again with same format, pretty much. We got the backgrounds, we have the ember elements, got the color fringing. I'm doing different focus. You can see how this is getting a little bit out of focus as it comes close to camera. This one's a lot more in focus since it's more of like a wider shot. But yeah, still loving the bokeh here, loving the separation. So this was really cool. In terms of like a first experience with Nuke, I'm more than happy. Um, you know, I was planning on just using it for the focusing and now I think I'm going to use it in all my projects. I mean, now obviously I invested in it and uh, it can do so much more than this too, by the way, it can do particles and, you know, animation and video, all kinds of stuff. So uh, this is just how I used it for this project. And that's how I made the final images. So that's it. That is how I made this orc. Uh, it was a fun project. I, I know it's a lot of time, 80, 90 hours. Uh, I don't know if that sounds like a lot to you. It sounds like a lot to me. It felt like a lot. I was working on this project in and around other projects too. So it wasn't just a straight shot and uh, the scope, you know, got out of hand like it does. So this was, this was a gargantuan project. I think the next few projects I do, I'll probably have a little bit of a smaller scope for a little time before I convince myself to jump into a huge one again. But 
I don't regret it at all. It was fun. I learned lots of stuff, actually. Um, some things I'm going to be taking with me on my next projects. Nuke, I think, is another crucial part of a workflow that uh, I'd like to do for fun. And uh, and I just like spending time in this kind of world, the fantasy, dark fantasy stuff, Lord of the Rings. So it was, uh, it was a cool way to spend time. That is it for this video. Uh, appreciate you making it this far. That's crazy. Uh, thank you for the questions and comments you guys have been leaving. If you left a question on the last video, I hope I got you an answer that you're happy with. If you have any more questions, ideas for future videos, leave it in the comments below. Always like to hear good ideas and things you guys want to see in future videos. So until then, peace out.